Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Greg Michalowski. Go into my uh, voice mode here, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about defining risk, limiting risk, accepting risk. This is a special ethics street webinar that I do once a month. Today's date is not the 26th, is it? It's the 25th. And all right, uh, I'm going to have to uh, ch change change that. Uh, I've got uh, oh, the power of uh, editing. Uh, I can do that uh, very easily. So today's date is a uh, the February 25th, 2014. Before we get started, let me remind everybody that uh, trading foreign exchange carries a high level of risk and may not be suitable for all investors. In addition to that, leverage creates additional risk and loss exposure. Should you decide to trade foreign exchange, carefully consider your investment objectives, your experience level, your risk tolerance. You can lose all or part of your risk capital in the foreign exchange market. So what I like to say is uh, be aware and be prepared. I'm here to provide you with uh, education on here. You can buy sell hold recommendations. Uh, but we do talk a lot about uh, defining risk and limiting risk and accepting risk. That's a, in fact that's the title of the uh, today's uh, webinar. All right, uh, who remembers uh, this uh, game uh, Risk? Okay, uh, this is uh, this is what my Risk game looked like when I was a kid um, or a child. Child uh, Parker Brothers Continental game. You can see the tape on the on the box. So those boxes didn't last very long. Uh, not much in the way of marketing uh, there. As, as time has gone by, they they, they started to redefine uh, what risk the game of risk was about, and uh, uh, the, the, it became the game of global domination. A little bit the higher graphics there, and then we started to get into the modern age where we had the Lord of Rings risk join the battle for the Middle Earth, uh, and uh, we also uh, talked about the uh, Metal Gear Solid. Uh, uh, version of the risk game, a game of strategic conquest. Uh, you get an idea of what the uh, game was about, and then uh, we got into Halo Wars. I don't know, I don't know what these these mean, but the uh, the Halo's uh, war game, and then uh, we even got into Zombie Risk, a game of up, 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 apocalyptic. How do you say that? Survival. Anyway, um, apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. That's a, that's a tongue tw tongue twister. I'm going to uh, pass on that, but. Uh, the zombie uh, game of risk, and um, risk. This is a game about global uh, domination, and uh, uh, it it uh, it uh, utilizes uh, and, glo and the way that uh, you won the game. Well, I'll talk about that in a little set, little little bit. But uh, first of all, uh, you know there are different types of uh, players of the risk game. Here we have uh, uh, four uh, men, and uh, one of them has a beer. The other one seems like they have a bowls of water here. Maybe that's to dip their hands in, so so that the, the any germs that they get on their hands when they move the pieces around and, and, and try to dominate uh, players uh, don't get on those uh, pieces. I don't, I, I don't know, but uh, uh, they look like they're having a good fun, and uh, so do these uh, military uh, people who are in the game of risk themselves, uh, serving uh, our country and other countries around around the world uh, to bring about world peace or safety around the world. And even kids uh, continue to play the game. This, uh, this uh, young, young man has uh, the Star Wars edition of Risk, probably doesn't know about horses and, 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 and uh, you know, countries countries around the globe, but he knows about the galaxies of, of uh, the Star Wars uh, game. And even um, uh, you'll get uh, people like uh, Putin and uh, Obama playing the game of Risk there. Uh, they may do it in a real world. I hope it doesn't have to happen that way. But uh, they, uh, you know, you know, global domination. You know, in, in the old days, this would be, you know, would have been, uh, you know, uh, Nixon and Khrushchev, or, or uh, there, there would be other other uh, players on there a little bit more serious. There, a risk may be a board game that was spanned generations, taken on a different looks along the way. <clears throat> but the game rewarded the slow, slow steady accumulation of countries protecting those countries ap apocalyptic there you go uh, protecting those countries attacking the opponent when the time is right and staying in the game staying in the game and you think about it trading is also a quote unquote game that has uh, spanned generations uh, taken on different looks along the way but still rewards Slowly accumulating profits, protecting those profits, attacking the trend when the time is right, and staying in the game. So the game of risk and the quote-unquote game of trading um, have some similarities, uh, similarities that um, 
uh, you know, gave me my theme for uh, today, and I'm going to uh, focus on that risk. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about who I am. I realize that uh, not everyone may know me, um, but um, I've been, um, you know, you may want to know what, what my qualifications are, uh, what makes me qualified to be speaking with you here today. And I've been working in the financial markets now for uh, 20 Eight years, 15 of those years were in the institutional market as an interest rate trader for uh, Citibank and uh, CS Credit for Boston. Uh, worked uh, for f- uh, 10 years in New York and Citibank and five years, I'm sorry, worked for uh, f- uh, six years in Citibank, New York, and then four years overseas in London. So I had a little bit of a international flavor in there. Came back to New York after um, a 10 year career at uh, Citibank. I, wanted, I, had to, I had to move back because I wanted to teach. Have my kids play football with a oblong ball as opposed to a round ball, I guess, and uh, uh, and be closer to family. So uh, at that point, I moved to CSFP. But I was involved in the institutional market. So I have this <coughs> this knowledge of uh, uh, what trading floors are like in institutional, what goes on, how they look at markets, and so on and so forth. Now, for the last 13 years, I've been with FXDD, and I've worn many hats uh, for the firm. I was I was I've been with the firm since. Day one, and so you know, at the beginning, I was doing uh, everything from account documents uh, uh, to um, you know designing. You know, I even did the first web page, and then uh, man, it helped to uh, manage the uh, the risk uh, within the uh, within the firm um, and um, uh, the you know the price fees, the relationships with banks, and so on and so forth, the liquidity liquidity providers, and uh, over the last. For five years, I've been more involved with being a trading mentor. It allows me, has allowed me to share what I've learned in <coughs> in various ways, in various uh, platforms. Pardon me for my cough, by the way, uh, but in various uh, platforms, uh, uh, and one of them is uh, this at FX uh, Street. Also, I'll talk around the world and talk at uh, different seminars, do things uh, daily on FX uh, FX DD as well. Um, in the process, I also wrote a book called Attacking Currency Trends, and you can find out about it or purchase it at www.attackingcurrencytrends or Amazon.com. And I'm happy to say that uh, I guess on Amazon, Amazon which um, and, uh, you know has uh, reviews of the book, it's probably one of the more uh, highly ranked uh, foreign exchange books. So if you're new to foreign exchange, if you want a a, 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 a book that is going to Take you on a journey about uh, you know how to trade the foreign exchange market. Uh, go to Amazon, take a look at the, um, the you know the reviews, read about it, do your due diligence or whatever, and buy the book uh, either from me or, or on Amazon.com. Anyway, that's a shameless uh, commercial, but um, nevertheless has 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 to be done. So in this uh, twenty year twenty eight year career of trading. Uh, 13 of the years on the retail foreign exchange side. side. Uh, what have I learned? Specifically, what have I learned from the retail side? Because that's what I'm talking to here today. I'm not talking to institutional traders like that. I assume most of you, if not all of you, are retail traders who are more interested in, you know, how to trade. What, what do I need? What do I need to do to be successful in the retail foreign exchange change market? And I, I um. I, I learned about common trader problems, okay, common trader problems. Remember, I, I'm i not just uh, – when I was at the uh, Citibank, um, my knowledge of trading was uh, self, self-taught self uh, with the help of mentors along the way. I, you know, I basically came out of college uh, – to the to the trading floor, so you don't have a lot of experience uh, there, nor do you see how traders uh, what traders do right, what they do wrong, and so when I transitioned over into the retail sector, I got to see and get a feel for how what traders do right, what they, what they do wrong, and the problems that they face. And then when I started to do more education, I got to listen to them and their problems. And the way that they approach the market, and all these uh, help de- develop, um, you know, a, a, a database within myself of uh, common trader problems. And I'm going to list just uh, three of them here. Uh, and um, you know, there, there may be more, but these are the main ones. So a lot of times, retail traders are focused too much on the reward. They focus too little on the risk, and they tend to take 
make things more complicated, more, make things more complicated. And so I've dedicated myself to breaking down these barriers, these problems uh, for the um, – in what I do and how I do it um, in, in the lessons that I uh, uh, teach and, and try to find the solutions uh, to these problems. And so let's focus a little bit on, on, on uh, too much focus – on the rewards first, okay? And um, once a trade is done, what I've come to the realization uh, to, to a realization is this: is that rewards will come if the market agrees with what you think. Once a trade is done, the rewards will come if the market and the, and notice in quotations mark markets the market agrees with what you think. And why do I? Why don't I put the uh, market in there? Because you cannot move the market. You as a retail trader have no power to move a currency pair in one direction or the other. You may think you do. A lot of retail traders think they do. So they have this, this idea of, um, you know, of a reward of them being able to move the market toward a uh, certain level. The collective market of buyers and sellers move the price up and down. You don't, um, you don't do that. And so th this idea of rewards has to come with a little caveat that the rewards are really not in your control because you cannot move the market in one direction or another. There are people and there are traders out there and, and um, you know, those, those big guys who move the market and you know, they pretty much can uh, dictate a profit if they, if they have enough power and oomph behind them, but uh, those are few and far between. But they they are definitely in control of the market. They also have bigger positions they have to ma manage, so it's not all that great for them either. But they have the ability to move the market. Um, and the other thing is that um, uh, about the market and the market moves and the, and the rewards that you will reap in your trading is that. You do not, uh, you do not know with certainty the influences in the future that will move the market up or down. And honestly, no one really knows for sure, and certainly not most retail traders. We all have this idea, um, that we know the fundamentals of the story that's going to move the market in one direction or another. And, that's going to lead to our rewards. But in reality, um, that white area that I call, that white area of the future, or that black hole, uh, you know, but I, I, I like to think of it as just a whole white area because that's what I use in the charts, and I'll show you in just a second. <clears throat> but that white area is filled of lots of uncertainty, lots of things that um, make that reward thought – that focus on rewards, kind of useless, all right? Kind of useless. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a thought of rewards. Where is my potential reward on the trade? But it is dependent on a lot of things, One, you know, or, or, or on two main things. One, that the market agrees with what you have to think about of the direction, so if you think the market is going up for this reason or another or going down for this reason or another, another uh, you have, uh, you know, you, whether that's technical or fundamentals, you have to have that market agree with what you are thinking, and that's not guaranteed. And you also have to uh, be a predictor of the future. You have to be a predictor of uh, what uh, Janet Yellen might say on Thursday or what uh, ECB's Draghi might say at his, at his uh, press conference next week or uh, what the um, – What's going to happen in uh, Ukraine or what's going to happen uh, with the uh, um, other influences in, in the market? And quite frankly, um, you know, the, my best advice uh, to uh, tra traders is uh, to just check your ego at the door in regard to this idea, in, in regard to this idea that, that the market's going to go in, in this direction and it's going to go up to this level or that level or, or another level along the way. Um, and that's not a bad thing, okay? In fact, it could be a good thing. Uh, too many traders come, to, come up to me 
at events um, or call me up or talk to them on the phone or send me emails and stuff. And and they will um, they'll immediately uh, talk about uh, well I'm short the euro I think it's going to 135 or 134 or 133 um, and that's good and fine to have that confidence in in your position and all but is it realistic? Chances are uh, no. So if you if you're focused too much on rewards. Try to th- try to t- check your ego at the, at the door and understand that you're not in control of your awards at all, re- rewards at all. In fact, the market's in control of it, of it at all times. That the um, uh, and that uh, you, you're not a predictor of the future. You cannot predict what may may or may not happen that cause the market to move one way, one direction or another. So, check that ego at the door. Um, understand that that's not necessarily a bad thing, and I'll show you one in a second. Uh, in fact, it can be a good thing because you don't you don't uh, you don't get that get those rewards um, set in your mind, uh, and you can now focus on on risk. So let's take a look at a chart here, and 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 you know I want to demonstrate I guess a little bit about this idea of about reward, rewards, and I also talk a little bit about the area in the chart. The bar- <clears throat> this goes back to earlier this month. The price had trended to the ups because we had weaker employment uh, on this. Uh, Day right here, the market moved higher. Actually, I think it was this day right here. The market moved higher, and we continued to move higher over the the weekend and Monday. And um, <clears throat> so, when you look at this uh, ch- chart, um, you see a trend to the upside, and uh, you have this uh, fundamental news that the weak performance is going to uh, weaken the do- dollar. The euro is going to get stronger. The dollar is going to get weaker. Um, and uh, but we have this white area. This white area where we don't know what is going to ha- happen here. Are we going to go higher or lower? We just have this uh, perception of which way the market is going to go. And if you thought that the, the market was going to go higher and continue that fundamental trend to the upside, you were wrong. The market went down 120 uh, pips uh, to the downside, and, and uh, we move all the way to the downside. And we uh, now now you get into another point where you have to figure out, okay, wh- wh- where is my rewards going to be? Or is it is it continuing to the downside? Or are we going to continue to the upside? Is 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 the rally over? We're we going to move lower. And indeed, the market moves back to the upside. We go back higher. And now we, we enter into uh, this is like last night when I took this picture of what are we going to do now? Where is the reward going to come from now? So there's no, there's, when you look at a playing chart, when you look at, when you look, uh, take into consideration fundamentals and your ideas of where you think the market may or may not go. The point, the point is the market go wherever it wants, wherever it wants, when, whenever it wants. <coughs> And the 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 risk or the um, the downside to that idea, when they focus too much on the rewards, they become blind to the risk of loss when the market does not do what you think it should do. When you see the price moving up because of the employment number, and and we're we're focused on uh, the market's going to go higher here, the dollar is going to get sold off, the U.S. economy is weakening, weakening, and you have all these ideas, these preconceived notions about where you're going, why it's going there. And you lose lose track of the risk, and you become blind to the risk of the loss. And those losses can be 120 pips. And it's hard to live through those 100, 120 pips when you're losing that 120 pips on your trade. It's not easy. And the other thing is, since our retail traders cannot move the price and influence the reward, and since the market can take the price higher or lower for any rate reasons, traders should re- recognize that they have little reward control. The fact of the matter is, folks, is that you have little reward control. You don't know what your opponent's going to do in that game of, of, of risk. You may have an idea of what they may do, but you don't know how they're going to react. And whether it's risk or it's, it's chess or it's some other game out there, you do not have an idea about what may or may not happen down the, down the road. And so to re, to focus too much on reward is doing doing a disservice uh, to you as a trader. So why why uh, um, why is risk typically not as important as reward to um, retail traders? And um, unfortunately, you know, most retail traders, especially when they start off, they try to try to be positive about what they what they're trying to do. And so to focus on reward seems like the logical thing to do. Why focus on the negative, on the loss of trading? Why, why not stay positive? 
And so there's this human element involved in why we focus on rewards and not risks uh, as much. And that becomes a driving force for a lot of traders. So I'm trying to tra- change your mindset is what I'm trying to do here, uh, to think more in terms of risk. But, uh, in order to do that, I, I want to you know, break down this idea of focusing too much on reward, the other side of the equation. Most people are used to winning in life versus losing. You know, most of us graduate from high school, a lot of us graduate from college, a lot of us go on to successful careers, and we're used to winning, you know, winning, of, of being good at something. Um, and, um, you know, if, if you're going to get uh, uh, D's and F's in, 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 uh, in, co- or in, in school, um, you're, you know, few people do that. Most people get A's and B's and C's, and then they're used to, Getting 70, 80, 90 percent of the questions right because you know we are we strive to do well. Lots of retail traders also try to understand the market movements through fundamental analysis. And the problem with the fundamental analysis is that, that you start to develop this strong conviction about what seems to be logical for a movement in a currency pair move movement in the dollar, movement in the, in, in the euro, movement in the currency pair, one way or the other. <clears throat> and so you become married to this conviction, to this fundamental uh, view of the market, and that focuses more on the rewards. You lose track of other things that may be influencing like technicals, and we'll get into that in just a second. But uh, there's this uh, – lots of retail traders try to understand the market through the fundamental uh, – analysis picture. And that takes precedence over technicals a lot of times, especially for beginning traders. For beginning traders. So if you're a beginning trader and you're and you're press you, you you find that your focus is on fundamentals, you're probably more focused on the rewards because the fundamentals are are supposed to be a truism. You think that you know all the things that are caused the euro to move higher or lower, but you really don't if there are other things that yeah, get involved. But nevertheless you have that preconceived concept, uh, notion. Um, you also, uh, uh, traders also get, get uh, when they have this uh, fundamental analysis and, uh, and they're used to winning and, and um, uh, you know, trying to stay positive with the trade, um, they often become immune to the losing trades with the understanding that the market will eventually turn around. After all, the foreign exchange market is an up and down market. When one, one currency gets stronger, that uh, slows their economy, should they slow their economy. So they can't go up forever, or it can't go down forever. And so the feeling becomes, uh, well, if I just focus on my reward, eventually my reward's going to come in because the market will eventually turn around. And most uh, retail traders uh, at the beginning, or a lot of retail traders, are more, uh, or uh, thinking in terms of trading as more gambling than, than trading. Now, they may not know it is gambling, they may think trading but if you focus on um, uh, focus things on too much on fundamentals if you stay with positions for too long if you don't understand risk if you don't define your risk if you don't take losses um, you're, you're just gambling you are not trading you're not managing your trade in the in the right way and there's a difference between gambling and trading trading has nothing to do with gambling it may seem like trading can be gambling and you can make trading gambling but um, most uh, most retail traders when they start off when they start thinking about rewards, they're just thinking about gambling. They're just thinking about betting red or betting black and getting the high from that ga- gambling um, uh, uh, feeling that um, a lot of us have. <clears throat> so focusing on the reward is a long approach for most retail traders. Instead, retail traders should switch their focus, and that's what I'm trying to do, switch your mindset to focus on the risk side of the of the equation, not the white areas in the, in the charts, that uncertainty, those black holes, those areas where you don't know whether the market's going to move up or down, but you want to focus on the, um, uh, on the, uh, uh, on the risk side. And uh, when you do that, that, that is a different uh, focus. And by focusing on, ri- on, on risk, retail traders – are making efforts, these are some of the advantages of focusing on risk, making an effort to conserve trading capital. They're recognizing that losing 
Losing is a part of trading. You're not, not just going to be in this trade because you know it's going up. up um, and you are going to recognize that losses are part of trading. Acknowledging that you are, uh, there are other fundamental forces that can move a market one way or the other. No matter what you think about the fundamental picture of the market, that fundamental picture changes all the time. Changes from second to second almost from hour to hour, from day to day, uh, or it can change from day to day, depending upon what news or what fundamental um, uh, driving force is going to move the market today, next week, or that month after. And there are times when the market does trend, uh, but but by focusing on risk, you are, you are acknowledging that there are fundamental uh, forces that can um, change and, and move the market one way or the other. And you're also acknowledging that you require – the quote-unquote market to agree with you, and also that you do not influence, uh, you do not exert an influence on the market's uh, movement. So you don't have an ego. Okay, when you focus on risk, you you are checking your ego at the door. You are not. You are you are taking a more humble view. Some may think that it's a uh, less positive view. But um, the way the way that I look at it is that you are running your business to conserve trading capital, conserve trading capital, and that's a good thing for business. That's a good thing for, um, f- and that's a positive thing for you as a trader. And you're making a commitment to trading, not gambling, when you focus on risk. The difference between gamblers and traders is that gamblers go all out. They over leverage. They, uh, um, they, don't, they don't try to put the odds of success in their favor typically. Now, um, now there are gamblers out there who are risk, um, risk-based gamblers. And it's kind of a, kind of, kind of a mis- misnomer. They are more traders than they are gamblers when they understand the risk. They define the risk that they get thrown out of the casino if they start to get too good because they – they define the risk. They think about the risk side, the money management side of it, and uh, they, uh, they're asked to leave. So when I think about risk, I think about three things. Um, and and if so if you're going to change your focus on risk, you have to focus on three things. One, defining risk, limiting risk, accepting risk. Write that down. Live by it. Understand it. Think about it. Think about it during every trade, and you'll be checking your ego at the door. You'll be starting to do the right things. You start start to become a trader as a, as far as, far as a, versus a gambler. You're starting to to understand how to become a more successful area. Define risk, limit risk, and uh, accept risk. So the, so the question beca- then becomes: How is risk defined? If you're going to enter a trade, how do you define a risk? And the simple answer to that is risk is defined by trading near key technical levels. Risk is defined by trading near key technical levels. Now, there's a big assumption here um, that I make here, and, and that is um, near key technical levels. So what defines a key technical level? And for me, the definition of a, a key technical level is a price level that is derived from technical tools that are used by many. Okay, uh, by technical tools that are used by many. I don't want to use technical tools that are used by few. I don't want to use technical tools that are derived by me. I don't want to use um, a combo, com, uh, or a, a bunch of technical tools that come into some sort of formula that tells me to buy buy low buy here or sell here. Um, I don't want to use that. I want to use technical tools that are used by many. If you use technical tools that are used by many, you have the power of the many, of the power of the many. And the power of the many is what's going – remember that we cannot move the market. We cannot move the market. We as individuals, as retail traders, we cannot move the market one tip. You go out and buy your one lot, it ain't going to move the market, Okay. You go out and buy your 10 lots, it's not going to move the market. You've got to buy 50 or 60 or 70 lots at a time, and then, and then it's going to move the market. All right, so we cannot move the market. So if, we, if, if we're going to um, find key technical levels, we have to find key technical tools that are going to be used by many. And then we have the chance that a lot of people are going to be dealing at the same time, at the same area, the smart people, that is. 
Uh, and they're going to, that's going to actually move, uh, work in our favor. And, uh, we have to, we have to use, um, a price level that tells the trader, buy says bull, bullish, bearish below. I am, I am one about a borderlines, I call them borderlines. Levels, levels, a technical levels that, um, it, it's either going to be bullish above and bearish below. <laughs> so if you, so, um, the technical tool has to be what I call unambiguous, okay? It can't be ambiguous. An ambiguous uh, tool is one that uh, tells you overbought or oversold. That is an ambiguous trading tool because a market can get over, even more overbought or a market can get even more oversold, um, and that hurts your position. Imagine that, um, you know, close your eyes and imagine that the price is moving higher. It's in a trending market, and the market is overbought from some technical tool like an RSI or stochastic. And imagine that um, you sell the market because the market is overbought at that level. Well, the market can continue to get overbought and move higher and higher and higher, and that RSI can continue to go higher and higher and higher. So my technical tools and the major ones that I use are ones that are going to tell me bullish above and bearish below. They're not going to tell me that it's overbought or it's oversold. It's going to tell me that the price moved below this uh, this uh, this uh, technical tool, so it's now bearish, or the price moved above this technical tool, so now it's bullish. And and that that my friends defines helps define risk by knowing where whether it's the bias is bullish or bearish. It, it does it automatically by the fact that it's bullish above or bearish below. The technical tools that I use have to be visual to many. Again, that word many it has to be very visual. The trading is a visual game. Okay, it's not. Um, you know, that's not fundamentals. You know, fundamentals. Um, uh, even with even with fundamentals on. Um, uh, when fundamental comes out, like a, a piece of data, like consumer confidence comes out today and it comes in weaker than expected at 78.4 or wherever it, it came out, um, and, it, and it's weaker than the 80.5. Yes, it's weaker than the 80.4 they're expecting or 5 that they're expecting, but in relation to um, the history of the consumer confidence, it's still pretty strong. It's near the high of the range I've seen, you know, over a few years. And so, so I want to, uh, you know, I want to see a visual, a chart of the consumer confidence. Well, that's why I put it on my website. So um, and the same goes true in, in charting of pricing, charting of the euro versus U.S. dollar, story versus U.S. dollar. You want to see, you want to see it. It's a visual game. You want to see um, the support and resistance. You want to see the price move below it or go above it. And so the, the tools that I use have to be very visual, visual to many, to many. Give the traders um, multiple reasons uh, to trade. A key technical level. Gives trade um, gives traders uh, oftentimes multiple reasons to trade. So at uh, you know 137 uh, even or whatever uh, the you know if there's multiple reasons to trade there, that becomes a key technical level. I know it's um, uh, it, it, it can be ambig- ambiguous. I mean, you can have a, you can have a key technical level that is just one thing. 100-day moving average. That is a, a, a technical um, a tool that is uh, used by many. Uh, moving average, 100-day moving average. Tells tr- uh, the trader a bias, bullish or bearish. Is visual to many. Is broadcast on CNBC. Uh, uh, but it may only give you one reason to trade. That's okay. That's okay. You know, three out of four ain't bad. But if you can find re- multiple reasons to trade, that's going to help uh, put the odds of success in your favor. Um, so because of these things, one, two, three, four, uh, there tends to be an energy around the trading level, around the key technical level. So what that means is that either you're going to be right really quick, uh, fairly quickly or wrong fairly quickly. And there's nothing like having that fear disappear. Either you're going to be right or you're going to be wrong. You know, either it's going to work for me or it's not. And it's going to do it sooner rather than later. I'd rather know. Uh, what the devil is um, as soon as possible rather than have it prolonged and prolonged and then understand, oh, wow, he's really the devil. No, I'd rather understand it sooner rather than later. So that's what we try to do uh, with finding key te- technical levels. So ra- why should a risk be limited? Why should risk be limited? So we talked about defining risk. Now let's talk about limiting risk. And by focusing on limiting risk, a, a trader is automatically trying to keep their loss to a minimum. Now, don't get me wrong. 
Limiting risk doesn't mean that you don't take risk. Limiting risk doesn't mean that you don't take risk. It just means that you're focused on risk. You're trying to limit it as much as possible, just like any business. Traders sometimes get out of this idea that they are not a business, and they don't have to uh, play by the rules of business. But anyone who's owned a business, anyone who's worked for a business, understands that you are focused on you're keeping your losses, your costs, to a minimum. And losses in trading are your costs. It's your fixed costs, um, uh, although they're variable. Um, but they, they are your, fix, your, your costs of, to your business. They subtract from your bottom line. And so by limiting risk and understanding that I need to define my risk and thinking, you know, this is the mindset again. I need to define my risk, and I also need to limit my risk. And so I want to be focused on limiting my risk because I want to keep my losses to a minimum. I don't want to have big losses. I want to keep them as small as possible. By focusing on limiting risk, a trader is recognizing that the trader level, trading level is an energy level, a key technical level. That is either going to result in a winning trade or a small losing trade. Limiting risk allow, allows the possibility of making a multiple of the risk on a trade. It allows you to make allow the possibility of mo- making a multiple on the risk on a trade. Uh, by limiting a risk, it keeps traders' fear to a minimum. If you know you're only going to lose this amount beforehand and it's a limited amount and you have reasons to trade and you have understanding of why why it's going to be it's going to keep your fear to a minimum fear is a trader's worst enemy so limiting risk keeps your fear to a minimum it keeps the trader in the game as well it keeps a trader in the game by limiting risk you are in the game in in the risk game forever for for as long as you you know your account balance goes you may lose 20 20 20 trades in a row but if you do it right um, you're not going to disappear from the game. And the, and the one thing about retail traders is the longer you stay in the game, the better chance you have to win the game. And it even allows for uh, bigger positions. Okay. Now let's, uh, let's, uh, let, I want to talk, talk a little bit about a multiple, um, to make a multiple of the risk on the trade and also allows uh, for a bigger position. I'll do just a little example here. So let's say that you have a, a risk limit of 2% of your account and you have a account balance of $10,000. Now, if you're going to risk 2, 2% on any, any one trade and you have 10000 your maximum loss on the trade is $200. $200 okay. Now, uh, if the risk, if, you, if a, lot of, a lot of retail traders make this mistake and they say, well, I'm going to risk 50 pips on the trade. If you can't risk 50 pips, you know, why, why trade? Okay, so mathematically, if 50 pips times $10 per pip, let's assume it's a euro, the stone that you're trading, is a loss of $500 on a trade. So if your stop loss is randomly set at 50 pips, you're going to lose $500 on a trade. Now, if your maximum loss, uh, because you want to use proper money management, is 2%, uh, your maximum loss is um, uh, $200, and you take $200 divided by 500, uh, which is your maximum loss, you can do a maximum lot position of 04 lots on that trade all right and um what do you have to make uh, to get two to one on that trade you have to make a hundred pips on that trade so if you're going to risk 50 pips every once in a while you got to you got to try to make a hundred pips on a trade now how easy is it to make a hundred pips on a trade and most people know it's not that easy to make a hundred pips on a trade especially in this environment that we're in right now now let's say that uh instead you're focused on risk and you're focused on limiting risk if risk is defined and limited and you trade near key technical levels, let technical levels where the market's either going to move in your favor or move against you, you can, you can in, in effect, risk, let's say, 15 pips on a trade in, an act, uh, you know, in, a, in, a, in a normal market. All right? So if what's about 15 pips on 10 is $150. So if you have a 200 maximum loss, you can do 1.33 lots and still only risk 2% on your account. So you can do a larger amount uh, because you you are defining and limiting your risk. You are picking those spots where there are key technical levels along the way, with multiple reasons to trade using tools that a lot of people use, and so on and so forth. So look at the leverage that you get from that position. Now, now you may you may say I don't feel comfortable doing 1.33 lots. I'm only going to do uh, half of that. 
in which case you're not risking one, and I'm going to use the same 15 pips, in which case you're not risking 2%, you're risking 1% on your account balance now. And so you get to stay in the game longer. And that's the name of the game. The longer you stay in the game, the better off you're going to be as a trader. So it comes down to these little little math things right here, here that you know either you can use a leverage for you, or you can use use a leverage to save your capital to keep your risk to a limit. But it requires you to do a little bit more homework. It requires you to look at charts and and um, and add tools tools that are going to define your risk and limit your risk. So here. That was the original chart that we looked at right here here when we looked at the white area. And we don't know what's going to happen in the white area, but we, what, we do, what we do know is that we have a history behind us here, a history that allows us to put tools on the, tr on, the, on the chart, tools like a trend line here. That's my tool number one. Um, this is a trend line as well. Uh, this uh, connects lows to a low to a low to a low to a low to a low. Right here, it's just a horizontal trend line. Some people call it a floor. You know, if you have it above, it's a ceiling. Um, I call it a, a remembered line, a line that the market remembers, remembers, it remembered, it remembered, it remembered, it remembered, and then it then it broke through. Yeah, floor, ceilings, whatever. So trend lines. Uh, you have horizontal trend lines. You can have upward sloping. You have downward sloping trend lines. Moving averages. I use a hundred and I use a two hundred simple moving average. The simple moving averages. The blue lines always. Always uh, uh, the 100, the green line's always at 200. And I use a third tool, Fibonacci retracement, because tr markets move higher, like we saw here, on unemployment, and then they correct. And they correct down to the 38.2, the 50%, 61.8. Those are the three Fibonacci retracement levels I use. Those are the ones that um, uh, define risk and limit risk against these levels. All right? So when, when the market breaks through the trend line right here, it tells you that the, the, the bias turns from bullish to bearish here. And we go down, and we go down to our lows, and then we get this uh, reactionary move back to the upside, and we, and we, and we, uh, we come to the, back to the underside of the trend line, and the market finds sellers, and it moves back down again to our support area. And this time, we don't move higher. We break below, and we go, go below this horizontal trend line. We also go below 100, we come to 200, and we, and we also move our way to, through these, these uh, Fibonacci retracements. I consider these probably three of the most followed tools on, that are are in any trader's toolbox. And those are the only tools that you need to have. Remember back at the beginning I said traders tend to make things more complicated. Three tools, that's it. You don't need any more. You don't need any less. You know, this is all you need. Or this is all that I found that you need. Okay, you can you can supplement or whatever, but make sure that your tools define risk, limit risk, are used by many and tend to um, uh, have an energy around them. One one key thing to understand about any tool that you use is I want to see I want to see this horizontal trend line I want to see the energy on the break I want to see the energy on the break of 100 I want to see the energy slow down at the 200 and do something away from here either go down or to go go above that level or the 61.8 or the 50 percent I want to see an energy at these levels and that determines what happens so let's uh, let's uh, take a look at um, uh, this. Uh, this is this is the same same thing as this this but um, it's um, it's blown up a little bit okay so here here here's what I do in my my analysis is I'll just put in levels of of uh, where I can define risk and limit risk and I'll try to find multiple reasons to trade okay so in this uh, this chart right here we have the hundred hour moving average and that tells you bullish above and bearish below so if the price were to come down to this hundred hour moving average. We know something's going to happen. Either the price is going to bounce off that hunt, or this is what we, we, we feel because it's a tool that's used by many. We saw it bounce here. We saw it break through here, and we saw it fail through there. And, you know, there, there, there is activity that happens around these levels. Sometimes the activity fails, and the market moves, moves back to it. Like we break below here, and we come to the 200, and then we get the move to the upside. It doesn't doesn't make this tool any worse. It just said that we, we consolidate here. We should have gone lower here. We should have gone through 100 and didn't it start to move back higher. So what do we do? We see we have the 100-hour moving average here. What else do we have at this level? So as a trader, as you're setting up this trade, trade and forget what happened here, what do you know about this specific level right here? It has one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, nine, nine, nine lows or high, lows or one high, I guess here, where the price um, 
or the price found support. So this yellow area became a key level of support. Now, it also happens that the low of the yellow area, which happened to be this high right here, corresponds with this level right here, the 100-hour moving average. So I had, I had reasons to trade outlined, reasons that other traders can see. If you are looking at this hourly chart, what are you going to look at, at as a key level? This level right here. Why? Because the market raced to the upside and then came down. Just that in alone in and of itself makes it important. If you then, then you can add two and three and four where the market moved above this level and found support, found support, and moved higher off that level. And then came down to five and six equal, and then came down to seven, found support, and moved a little bit higher, and then came down to eight and nine, and moved a little bit higher. And it's setting itself up as a key level. Setting itself up to as a key level, the market moved below that level of end of three minutes. And the market moved through that level. So what are you risking on the trade? Three, 10 to 13 pips. How do you define your risk? Well, this yellow area. You define your risk. You limit your risk against this level. If you sell below that level, you're looking for the, you're defining and limiting your risk. The market goes down in your favor. Now what happens down here? The market starts to slow down at the 200 hour moving average. We also have a 61.8% retracement, and we have these lows going back to here. The market fell through the 200. Remember, we looked at that. And then we started to base and try, and we couldn't get the momentum. We couldn't find the energy to the downside anymore. So the market eventually had found the energy to the upside. This is key here. This corresponds to 61.8, also the 200. So can risk be defined? Yes, risk can be defined right here, 15 pips. Risk can be limited. If the market goes and breaks below this level, what do you lose? 15 pips. What do you win? I don't know. The white area is unknown. I don't know how much I'm going to win, but all I know is I, I risk 15 pips. If I make 15 pips to the upside, I'm going to be okay. Okay? And so what happens? The market, uh, here's a trade. that uh, risk the uh, 15 pips. The market moved higher. Um, or, you know, I had it 14 pips here, but the, uh, or, or actually it was down here. Down here. This is a 15 pips. The market moved higher. Um, and and it bounced off of that level. So p positive trade. We get to another area right here. Um, so ignore ignore what happened here. Just understand that the market came down. We bounced off this level. The market moved higher, higher. Okay, okay. That, then the market moved above that level and moved higher through that level through, through 53, 87, 97, 145, five pips. Define your risk and limit your risk. I hope what you understood uh, here today um, is this, is, is that the um, uh, risk can be defined and limited, or, or risk needs to be defined and limited in order, to, in order for you to, um, to trade. If you focus on risk, that is going to um, set yourself up for the potential reward. If you don't win on the trade, um, your loss should be limited, 14 pips, 15 pips, 20 pips probably at the most. And from there, you have the opportunity to, uh, to participate in the reward. The reward is an afterthought in trading. The risk is what you as a trader should focus on. I want to thank the people at the FX uh, Street for allowing me to uh, participate in this uh, webinar um, and uh, wish you all good fortune in your trading. See you next month. Bye-bye now.